Okay, it is seven o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's virtual writers workshop. My name is Salim. I will be serving as your host tonight and will help navigate questions. Um, our topic tonight is where to begin. And in this webinar, you will learn uh, the basics of how to plan out and start writing your short story from editor and writer at the guard. Before I introduce Ekta, I do want to give a few updates about the library. So we are open um, and back to our normal hours. However, if you're not comfortable coming in just yet, um, we did continue our curbside delivery service. This is where you can pick up items or request items at home and pick them up in front of the library during designated hours. So for more information on that, you can visit champagne.org slash curbside. If uh, you need help and you want to reach out to staff, there are a few ways you can do that. You can schedule a consultation with one of our experts. So the link is there on the screen. You do that by going to champagne.org slash book a librarian. You can chat with us anytime the library is open. Um, our chat feature is located on our website towards the bottom of the page. And you can also email us at librarian at champagne.org. I also want to share a few instructions for communicating through Zoom tonight. So depending on your device, uh, towards the bottom of the screen at the center, you should see the option to chat. This is where you can type your question in. Next to that is the option to raise your hand. Um, this is if you prefer to use your mic and we can unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, we appreciate if you could hold all your questions for ECTA until the end of her presentation and she will address them then. With that said, I'd like to now introduce our presenter. Ekta began her career in publishing, working as the editor for Pampton Media in Portland, Oregon. Since then, Ekta's diverse career has led to writing and editing in multiple areas, including healthcare, home improvement, and Hindi film. In 2010, Ekta added blogging to her resume by starting The Right Edge. This is where you can find her short fiction, book reviews, and parenting adventures. The Right Edge also serves as a tool for fellow writers who hire Ekta to edit their uh, writing projects. Tonight, she's here to share her expertise with all of us. Ekta, thank you again for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Salam, so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming back um, to listen to me talk about the craft of writing. I am just going to um, share my screen so I can get my slides up here. And um, I, my printer did something really funny this time around with printing out my notes. So if you see me fumbling with papers over here, that's why. Um, so I, I just hope I don't drop all of them on the floor. That would be, you'd see my head duck down and it would just look good. Um, but anyway, so I'm gonna share my screen and then um, get this. you see that song? Yes, I can. All right, let's get this started. All right, once again, uh, my name is Ekta Garg, and I wanna thank you so much for coming to tonight's talk on the craft of writing. But tonight we're gonna be talking about how to start a new short story. If novels give us a doorway into the lives of characters, then we can say short stories are the window into what our character's going through. The view is a little bit smaller, but it's no less powerful. Just ask Alfred Hitchcock and the characters in his famous film, Rear Window. When you're writing a novel, you're giving readers a chance to settle in. They know they're going to form long-term relationships with the people in your book, and they're ready to do so. By the end, readers have seen characters experience significant events in their lives where they change forever. Not all of those moments of change need a novel, though. Not all of them need a full book to examine how a character goes from one life-altering point to another. That's where short stories come in. You don't always need to walk into the home of someone's life. Having just that window of view is enough. Whether you write for yourself as a hobby or you want to be published and read widely, writing short stories is a great way to get better at your craft. A dedicated practice of drafting short stories helps you polish so many of the essentials that writing and publishing teachers keep emphasizing, like show don't tell, make every word count, go straight to the heart of the action, keep readers engaged from start to finish. 
On the more practical side of things, short stories are perfect for people who want the satisfaction of a good read without spending the hours it takes to read a book. While there are contradicting reports about how much people are reading versus how many books they're buying, there's no denying the fact that we have way more options competing for our time these days. With everything from social media to the news, from streaming platforms to our families, we feel like we're pulled in more directions than ever before. Some people, bookworms like me, and I'm sure like many of you, fight against all of those things to read novels anyway. But many people are looking for the emotional payoff of a novel without the time investment. They love splashing their feet in the world of fiction. They just don't want to take a deep dive. That's where writing compelling short stories comes in. It's a win-win for the writer and the reader. The reader gets to consume stories in a time frame that fits within their life, and the writer gets to practice the biggest pieces of writing advice in small, manageable bits. An added bonus is that if you blog your stories or publish them on a platform like Wattpad, and if you build a following, you'll have an audience ready and waiting for you if you decide you want to write a whole book. Of course, all that sounds great in theory, but what if you're having trouble getting started? What if you don't know where to find ideas for short story? What if you found a great idea but don't know how to proceed? It's actually easier than you think to tackle all of these things. We'll start with how to find ideas for short story. Some of these might seem obvious. Some of them might seem a little off the wall. The most important thing to remember is that writing is as much about interpretation as anything else. So don't hesitate to take an idea and start playing what should be every writer's favorite game, what if. As you're looking for ideas, there's one key thing to remember. Keep your writer's eye and ear tuned to the world around you. Most people will watch TV or read a news item or observe a situation in real life, digest it, and move on. Writers leave their curiosity on high alert, always. Does that mean you have to drop everything and write a short story right away? Of course not. It does mean though, that when something in real life or online makes you pause because it trips your imagination, you give yourself the luxury of stopping to make a note of it. Like literally, you make a note of it. Keep a notebook handy for story ideas. Grab a scrap of paper or open your favorite writing app and write a sentence or two to remind yourself of what you heard or saw. This way, you can go back to it later and allow your brain to tease out the possibilities of the ideas in an active, practical way. Writers by nature should be and are observers and deep thinkers of the world around them. Train yourself to take notice of things, and before you know it, you'll be inundated with more ideas than you know what to do with. I'll get into more detail what that means in a moment. Let's start, though, with the most traditional ways to look for short stories. If there isn't a scene or a character already bugging you for a closer look in a story, an easy place to start for ideas is with writing prompts. Thanks to the internet, there are hundreds of places you can go to find them. There are also dozens of ways the prompts are positioned, which might seem overwhelming at first, but is actually a gift because you can tailor the prompts to who you are. You can find writing prompts that give you a suggestion or ask a question. You can find prompts that are lines of dialogue, there are genre-specific prompts as well as websites that are random generators and will give you a different prompt every single time you click the button. Some writing prompts give you lists of objects or a character in a setting. There are even places to get writing prompts where you're given the first line of a story or the last line of a story and you have to create a piece in relation to those exact lines. It's helpful to know what kind of writer you are. Do you prefer to write in a specific genre? Then do a Google search for science fiction writing prompts or historical fiction writing prompts. Many times, online prompts come from organizations or with writing contests centered specifically on the prompts or the genres themselves. Even if you're not ready to enter a contest yet, you can see, still see what the organization has to offer in terms of prompts and use them in a story. I've bookmarked several sites myself, and at the end of the talk tonight, I'll share a few places where I like to go for writing prompts. If you're more of a visual person, you can look at pictures or paintings online or in books and get ideas from write, for writing that way. Start with a famous painting, for example, and do a little brainstorming based on what's going on in the picture. Are there people, 
animals? Does the painting show a dynamic scene? Try to challenge yourself by not going with the first or even second idea you come up with. Keep brainstorming ideas until you find one that surprises you and then start building a story around that. Tracy Chevalier did this with her novel, Girl with a Pearl Earring, based on the famous painting of the same name by Johann Vermeer. Chevalier saw the painting of the young girl whose gaze looked straight at you and devised a whole story around the girl and the painter. Her book was adapted into a film starring Scarlett Johansson and Colin Firth, and a play that premiered in London, but the source of all of it was a famous painting that sparked Chevalier's imagination. You can also look at pictures from famous botanical gardens and let your imagination roam free on what might happen in one of those places. See if the location of the garden within a city or a particular state or part of the country or the world can help shape part of the story. Ask what kind of people would go to this garden and start your story on the day everything changes for them. It might sound a little strange to say this, but there are small mercies we can enjoy due to the pandemic. One of them is that museums and botanical gardens across the world are allowing people to take virtual tours for free. Take advantage of this opportunity before a museum or a garden online and keep a notebook handy to jot down ideas. Maybe a famous painting or garden will pique your interest enough to play the what if games. If you're touring museums online, don't just stop at the paintings. Take a moment to look at the other works of art, like sculptures and exhibits. Historical author Susan Greeland wrote a wonderful novel called Clara and Mr. Tiffany, based on the Tiffany lamps that were so famous in the early 1900s for their multicolored glass shades. Greeland wanted to write about women who fought the establishment, and Clara Driscoll, the person largely credited with creating the distinct lampshades for Tiffany, fit that bill. Freeland rolled several themes into one story, women fighting for equal pay, the sheer joy that comes from creating a beautiful work of art, and the changing times. If you see an artifact or an interesting piece of furniture or anything else that strikes you as out of the ordinary, take a moment to let your brain settle on it. Then make a note of it, and come back to that concept when you have time to develop it some more. News items can spark a story idea as well. I'm talking about at what one time used to be known as human interest stories. These were the stories about people doing interesting things or getting themselves into extraordinary circumstances. You could take a person's story and play the what if game with it. What if they made a different choice at a crucial juncture in their lives? What if, instead of going on a crime spree, they turned their talents to curing cancer, or vice versa? A fun way to go about this is to go to, to the newspaper for a town that you don't live in. You can go to the library to see newspapers for different places or read many of them online. Local newspapers, the ones that are left anyway, are wonderful sources of human interest stories. Pick a newspaper for a town that's 100, 200, 1,000 miles away. Find an English language newspaper from another country and scan the headlines of the feature stories. I bet you'll find something that catches your eye and makes you stop and think for a few minutes. Or, by the same token, you could take a current headline and look at it through the prism of imagination. Find a new way to turn the idea around. This is exactly how Suzanne Collins got the initial idea for the Hunger Games. She was watching footage of the war in Iraq and flipping between it and reality TV show. Her writer's brain took the two concepts and melded them. She started playing What If, and now we have her incredible series. Several years ago, I came across a really cool story on Facebook that seemed tailor-made for a great novel or the movies. It's an urban legend that it was proven false, but it took a lot of calls to the police to convince people that this had never happened. The short version of the story is this. A parking attendant worked at the Bristol Zoo outside of London for 25 years. This man showed up for work every single day and was kind and courteous as he collected parking fees from every car and bus that came to visit the zoo. One day, he didn't show up for work, and another zoo employee alerted the management, who then went to the employee records office and discovered that they didn't have the man's contact information. The management office called the city, figuring that maybe the parking attendant was a city employee instead. The city said they had no record of the man either. More than that, it wasn't under their jurisdiction to hire a parking attendant for the zoo. 
They had never done so. And the zoo, zoo realized that this parking attendant was a private citizen who had just shown up one day and started taking money from visitors. When they did a rough calculation based on how much he was charging different types of vehicles, they realized that he walked away with around $7 million. This story originally ran in a newspaper in the real life town of Bristol as an example of an April Fool's Day prank, but it kind of backfired on the newspaper. Both the Bristol police and the newspaper said that for years afterward, they kept getting calls about the parking attendant wanting to know if the story was true. Maybe the joke was on the newspaper that ran the story. In any case, joke or not, this kind of urban legend is just begging for a savvy writer to make it into a clever story. Maybe it turns into an Ocean's Eleven kind of heist piece. Or maybe it's about a man wanting to get revenge on the owner of the zoo for some reason. No matter what a writer might do with it, stories like this that circulate on social media are excellent writing prompts. All social media outlets have search engines as well, so just plug in the term writing prompts and you'll see whole accounts dedicated to them. Browse some and start following the ones that look promising. A bonus of social media is that you'll also start noticing other writing related news and events, which can help you find workshops and classes that you could take in the future. You might not think that what you do on a daily basis is interesting enough for a story, but once you start paying close attention to the things that you see and hear in your regular routine, you'll see story potential in them. Here are a couple of examples from my own life. I have a post office box for my editing business so that I can direct all mail and payments to that box instead of my home address. Last month, I went to the post office on a Sunday to check my box. The business area where you can mail things and buy stamps, that was closed and no one else was around. As soon as I entered the post office, though, I could see that something was different. The door to one of the post office boxes was open. As I got closer, I realized the open door was two slots above my own. I checked my mail, and then, yes, I peeked inside the open box. I saw a letter and a key on top. The boring part of this story is that I collected my mail, got into my car, and drove away. But that open post office box stayed with me. How did it get left open? For those of you who have post office boxes, you know that you need a key to get into them. And the way the key functions, it would be kind of hard to leave it unlocked and walk away without realizing it. But the writer in me knows that if a person is distracted or upset enough, then they could very easily do just that. Also, another part of me considered that I could have very easily taken the letter and the key inside and walked away with it. The key might have gone to one of the larger boxes meant for packages. What if I had taken the key, opened the larger box, and walked away with the package? Here's another scenario. One day, I was up here in my writing studio editing a novel. I heard barking from outside, but I ignored it for a little while. Our next door neighbor has three small dogs that bark a lot if anyone they don't know walks by. I figured our neighbors probably had someone working on their lawn or their pool, and I really didn't think anything of it. Then, as I continued to work, I noticed that the dogs were still barking. I had no idea how long it had been, but it felt like the barking had been going on for a while. My studio is on the second floor of our home, and our neighbors have a one story. Our master bath window gives us a perfect view of the neighbor's backyard, which is dominated by their pool. Normally, we keep the blinds down in the bathroom, but since I noticed the barking for a while, I climbed into the tub to take a look at what was going on next door. Two of the dogs were standing at the sliding door. The third dog, the biggest, was the big one doing all the barking. It stood halfway between the sliding door and the pool and kept making noise. As I continued to watch, I saw the dog trot to the sliding door and bark at it. A few times, it jumped up on the door on its hind legs, still barking. Now, I've never had any pets, but I've heard plenty of stories of dogs trying to alert people to a situation that just isn't right. I wondered if that's what was going on here. Smaller dogs would bark occasionally too, and all three dogs kept pacing back and forth in front of the door. I scanned the pool area. The pool was full, and there was a tube floating in it. I wondered if someone was hurt, who I couldn't see, and the dogs were trying to alert people inside. When I looked back to the sliding door, I saw a person inside walk by. The dogs got louder and more insistent. Then I saw someone's arm move up and down and I realized that that person was holding a cup. 
Whoever it was had definitely seen the dogs and wasn't too bothered by them. Even though it seemed a little strange to me that they were letting the dogs make all that noise and they weren't responding, I left the bathroom and went back to the studio to keep editing. As I walked away though, a small part of my mind couldn't help but think that in terms of a story, this would be a great setup to a murder mystery. So don't think that just because you're a parent or an employee in a quote unquote regular office situation, you've got a boring life. The heart of any story is a strong character and the unusual circumstances they encounter. Take the time to pay attention and you'll get all sorts of ideas. Once you've found a story idea that piques your interest though and mulled it over a little bit, it's time to start working on the story itself. But how do we do that? How do we take a fantastic writing prompt or an amazing painting and start writing a great short story? Every writer has a different process. Some of you like to plot your stories before you begin working on them. Some of you want to just sit down at the keyboard or with your notebook and let the ideas flow. I have to confess I'm kind of a plotter. While I don't map out every single scene, I do like to know the big things ahead of time so that when I'm pantsing part of the writing process, I have a general idea of where I'm going. My writing and my characters still surprise me a lot along the way, even when I know those big things. And depending on how comfortable you feel with it, you don't have to quote unquote plot everything down to the tiniest detail. Even putting down something like John and Susan fight here to stand in for a particular scene is enough. Giving your brain that much of a heads up will automatically redirect your energy, your focus and your imagination toward making that fight happen. Whether you're a plotter or a pantser, I highly encourage you to give yourself the grace of jotting down a couple of notes on your story. Pantsers, if that feels like too much structure, think of it this way. When a contractor is building a house, they know the plumbing and electrical work can only go in certain directions. They have all sorts of leeway on where to put bedrooms and walls. They can let their imaginations run free on paint colors and crown molding. Making those notes ahead of time gives your story the stability it needs to stand strong so your piece can hold up to any whimsical idea you add to it later. In an issue of Writer's Digest from 1959, novelist and crime fiction writer Donald Westlake offered writers some basic advice for constructing a story that still holds true today. He called it the 5C plot plan. The five C's are character, conflict, complication, climax and conclusion, and this is how we define each C. A character is anyone at all, or basically your protagonist. Your conflict is something for the character, and by proxy the reader, to get upset about. The conflict is usually connected to the antagonist in some way, and it's always connected to something the protagonist wants but can't get at the beginning of the story. Complication is where the, life, where the protagonist's life goes sideways. The climax is where the opposing forces in the conflict are brought together. And the conclusion is where the result is known, the conflict has ended, the character has either won or lost, basically the resolution of the story. We're talking tonight about how to start short stories. So why don't we take one of the examples I shared earlier and see how we can start a new short story with it based on the five C's. Let's go back to that Sunday afternoon in front of the post office box. But let's change up the particulars a bit. Instead of the post office, let's make it the bank of mailbox mailboxes outside an apartment building. In fact, the mailboxes are on the far side of the apartment complex, just out of sight of most of the apartment. Our character, let's call her Kathleen, comes to pick up her mail from her box and sees another box above hers unlocked and open. Kathleen gets her own mail, but she can't resist looking into the open box. She sees a key to one of the big mail slots where people can get packages. Let's assume that Kathleen retrieves a package and takes it home. Just like that, I've got the crumbs of the story. Of course, to make it work, we have to spend some time on the first C in our list, our character. What kind of person would take someone else's mail? It's a federal offense here in the States to steal mail meant for someone else. The person who would do just that, though, might not know that, or if they did know, they might not care. But why wouldn't they? We need to go back to who our character is and figure out more about her so we can know how she got to this point in her life and also what's going to happen next. Well, 
let's go back to the writing prompt or the event that I experienced myself and start with the facts. I went to the post office on a Sunday. Let's say Kathleen checked her mail on a Sunday. But why that day? Why not any other day, say, after work? What if she had planned to check her mail two days earlier on Friday, but she couldn't? Okay, but why couldn't she? What if something prevented her? What could that be? The mailboxes are within walking distance of her own building. Why would it matter whether she went on Friday at 6.30 in the evening or Sunday at 2 p.m. or on a Wednesday at midnight? We've already decided that she checked her mail on a Sunday, and logically we know there's no physical force stopping Kathleen from checking her mail at any time. What about an emotional force to stop her? What might that be? What if, when she left the office on Friday, she was so mad that she went out for a drink straight from the office? After that, she stayed in the bar for some food. By the time she went back to her apartment building, she was still mad, but now also too tired to grab her mail. She didn't even think about it. Okay, but what would make her so mad that she'd go straight from the office to a bar? For the sake of the exercise, let's go with an easy answer. Kathleen was in the running for a promotion at, say, a marketing firm and didn't get it. Why? Well, maybe her boss told her that she was a good employee, but she played it too safe too frequently, that she didn't take enough risks, and the boss wanted to promote someone who could take a leap of faith in order to make the marketing firm grow. Right there, we found a seed that can grow into a pretty vicious outcome. But it's not enough to have the seed there. We need to dig a little deeper to find out what would bring Kathleen to the point of stealing someone's mail. An act that on a normal day, in a rational mood, she'd never undertake. What if Kathleen has always been a rule follower? You know, a goody two-shoes. She was always the teacher's pet, the kid who sat up in front of class, the student who found true joy in how happy her teachers and parents and everyone else were when she brought home straight A's. If anyone needed a dependable person, Kathleen would be at the top of the list. These are all positive traits though, right? But what if this isn't the first time Kathleen's been passed up for an opportunity to advance in her career because she's determined to color within the lines? What if she's missed opportunities in her personal life too? What could those be? Maybe she had a failed relationship. Maybe, in fact, the reason why she lives in this town where she's gonna commit this crime is that she was moving away from a partner after, after a sad, heart-wrenching breakup. The partner was loving and supportive, but also impatient with Kathleen. She had so many opportunities to take a chance on the relationship, and help it progress further, but being a rule follower, being a rule follower is a good thing but it can also make a person afraid to take risks. Her ex was sick and tired of waiting for Kathleen to trust her heart, trust in their commitment, and they spent a long drawn out evening, evening crying and talking and ultimately deciding they should break up. That's okay, Kathleen thinks. I can do something big and bold. I'll move. Yep, that's it. I'll move to a whole new town. Yay for Kathleen except she stays in exactly the same career field and moves to an apartment that looks a lot like her old one. And really, the new town isn't that far from the old one either. In fact, it's in the same state. So has Kathleen really broken the quote unquote rules she set for herself? Not really. Right away, with a few minutes of brainstorming, we've set up not only Kathleen's personality and the core of who she is, but also we've brought her to the tipping point of an emotional state that will encourage her to make a choice she would otherwise never have made. Stories aren't just about people though. Remember the list of five C's? We've got a good start on the first C, our character. So why don't we do a little brainstorming on the second C, conflict? Remember, Donald Westlake said that the conflict of a story is something for the character and by proxy the reader to get upset about. And one of the easiest ways to upset a character is to bring another person into the mix. So how about this? Kathleen has a neighbor on her floor who is a little bit of a busybody and a chatterbox, the type of person who has a way of inviting herself inside even before you know she's done it. And she's always asking for help with things. Here's the start of some potentially great conflict. Kathleen, remember, likes to play by the rules. She'd never force herself into someone's home 
to chit chat for 20 minutes about The Bachelor or just expect that her neighbors will put up with her constant requests for a few scoops of coffee or dropping her mail key off and expecting other people to pick up her mail for her without even asking whether the other person was busy. Kathleen would never impose herself on someone else's life in this way. Her neighbor does though, and how? And for the last however many months, our play-by-the-book protagonist has been putting up with it. She's been polite and nodded and smiled, even though a small part of her brain has been demanding to know why she just doesn't kick out the neighbor. On any given day, no matter how late she is getting home from work or how tired she is, the manner she's been taught and the way she's been brought up prevents her from saying no to the woman. Of course, that was all before Kathleen got passed up for the promotion. Let's recap how our story has gotten so far. On a Friday evening, after spending the day fuming that she didn't get the new role at work that she wanted, Kathleen goes to a bar. She doesn't drink too much. She's driving after all, and her rule following habits aren't gonna dis disappear that fast. But she does have just enough to make the edges of her anger blur a little bit. Even with the promotion fiasco, she's a little pleased with herself for making the impromptu decision to go out alone. So she decides to stay and have something to eat. The food and alcohol make her sleepy, so she pays her bill and goes home. Let's say that when she gets back to her apartment, she sees a sticky note from that neighbor, we'll call her Rachel, on her door. Rachel is asking for yet another favor, although she doesn't mention what it is. She signs a simple R with a smiley face and Kathleen rolls her eyes. She has seen that R way too many times. For once, though, Kathleen isn't going to trot down the hall and ask Rachel what she wants. Instead, she pulls the note off the door, crumples it, and goes inside. Within a half hour, she's asleep in bed. The next day, she wakes up late, and her head feels fuzzy. Kathleen, after all, doesn't usually go drinking after work, and she's kind of a lightweight. The food she ate was greasy, and now she feels she's like she's got a brick in her stomach. As she's brewing coffee for herself, someone knocks on the door. All of a sudden, Kathleen remembers the sticky note and she groans. She feels she looks through the peephole, and yep, sure enough, there's Rachel with a bright, perky smile. Kathleen feels like bashing her own head against the door, but she doesn't. She opens it. Instead of pulling the door wide, though, like she usually would, she opens it just far enough for her to stick her head through and ask Rachel what she wants. As always, Rachel's got a favor to ask, but she just wanted to stop by and see if Kathleen's okay because she left a note on her door the night before, but Kathleen never responded, and she always does. And now that Rachel's standing here, she can see clearly that the note is gone. But, well, she doesn't want to assume anything, but she just hopes nothing, She just hopes nothing's happened because it's not like Kathleen not to get back to her right away. And this is where the heart of the conflict kicks in. Kathleen's already been on edge since the evening before. Rachel just coming over and assuming all this stuff about her is what tips her over. So she yells at Rachel. You can make this about anything. She can yell about something important or stupid, but the point is, is for them to have a few minutes of back and forth active conflict. And when Rachel says something hurtful to end the argument and Kathleen slams the door in Rachel's face, that's tension because the hurt feelings from the day before come rushing back to Kathleen. And those feelings bring back all the bad feelings about her breakup and both the breakup and her job situation. And yes, even the situation with Rachel underscore for Kathleen that she doesn't know how to live life outside of the lines. In these sorts of moments, people aren't thinking rationally. They're more prone to making hasty decisions. We've built our character and we've given her a conflict that will power her through the next seat in our list, complication. What if Kathleen, in a fit of fury, gets dressed and rushes out the door? She doesn't know where she's going exactly, but she knows she needs to get out for a little while. She jumps in her car and leaves the apartment. We can be nice to Kathleen and put her in a world with no quarantine, so maybe she goes to a movie or to the mall. Somewhere to take her mind off of everything. By the time she comes home, she feels a little better, but approaching the apartment complex just reminds her of everything that happened the day before and that morning. She slows down because another car is in front of her and she starts to pass the bank of mailboxes. She decides to check her mail and that's when she sees the open mailbox. And because she's gotten mail from it so many times before, she knows that the open box is Rachel's. 
Before her rational, rule-following side can argue back, she grabs the key inside of Rachel's mailbox and opens the larger box. There's a package inside, and Kathleen doesn't consider what she's doing. She just takes the package and throws it into the back of her car. A tiny piece of her grins in satisfaction. Says she can't break the rules. Hours later, though, the thought of the package bugs her. What should she do about it? It felt good at the time to take it, but now it worries her. Kathleen, remember, has always followed the rules. Breaking them makes her question herself, and it even makes her wonder whether she blew the situation out of proportion about the job and her relationship and, well, everything. She's got a good life, for the most part, but what if she got passed up for a promotion? She's getting a good salary, she has a decent home, and she doesn't have any terminal illnesses. There are so many people out there who don't have food on the table. Does she even have a right to complain? Let's say Kathleen has a crisis of conscience and goes back to try to put the package back in the mailbox, but she can't get the box open. She takes it back to her apartment and wonders what she should do. She considers taking it to Rachel as a peace offering, wonders whether she really wants to eat crow, and decides her conscience wins. She goes to Rachel's apartment and knocks on the door. There's no one there. Now she's stuck with the package and she has to face the fact that essentially she stole someone's mail. She may not know it's a federal offense, but she knows it was wrong. And remember, it's a Saturday, it's a Sunday afternoon, excuse me. So let's say the apartment manager's office is closed. She can't drop it off there with a clever excuse that she accidentally picked it up. Kathleen, our rule following protagonist, starts to panic a little. What does she do now? And whose idiotic idea was it to break the rules in the first place? How is it possible people do this all the time and not feel like they're about to have a breakdown? We may not have an answer right now, but we know one thing for sure. Kathleen's now in a situation that complicates her life. We have two C's left, climax and conclusion. We know something has to lead up to the climax and you have to make sure that what leads to the climax connected to an action that the protagonist takes. Remember, the most dynamic, memorable characters are active characters. When life situations come up, they don't sit around and wait for something to resolve those issues. They make decisions. They might make bad ones. They might decide on a course of action that will turn out to be a colossal mistake, but they always have agency, which is the publishing industry's way of saying characters are active participants in their lives. That active approach drives great stories. Kathleen is a rule follower, and every decision she's made up until this weekend has fallen right in line with that life philosophy. When things don't go her way, like she gets passed up for the promotion, she breaks her routine and goes out for a drink. When Rachel bugs her, she yells at Rachel and slams the door in her face. When she's reminded of the tension between her and Rachel, and really her and her entire life, she steals Rachel's mail. When she feels bad about it, she tries to return the package. At every major point in the story, Kathleen isn't sitting back and waiting for her life to change on its own. She's making decisions and taking action. Then she experiences the reaction to her actions and makes another decision to act. This is crucial because those decisions, especially the bad ones, are gonna lead straight to the climax. You have several options for Kathleen's action now because she has to figure out what should be done with the package. Does she ever return it to Rachel? Does she hold on to it for a while and then give it back? What if she never does? What if Kathleen opens the package and keeps what's inside? What if she opens the package and then throws out the contents? What if Kathleen just tosses the whole thing in the trash without bothering to open it in the first place? What if she throws it away only to find out later that there was something in there that Rachel really needed? Medication, maybe, or important papers. Or it could be a family heirloom coming to her after the death of a loved one. Even the most active characters are at the mercy of unexpected life events. What if Rachel has mysteriously disappeared? What if she's moved out without Kathleen knowing? What action will Kathleen take in these cases? We're talking tonight about starting short, short story. I'll let you tackle the climax and the conclusion for this one. What action does Kathleen take that leads up to the climax? Does it destroy whatever little friendship she and Rachel might have had? Does it make Kathleen second guess her overall life choices? Does she go back to the office and negotiate that, negotiate that promotion with her boss? Does she turn to a life of crime? 
The last C is conclusion, and there are many possibilities. Brainstorm some, and stop and write when one surprises you. Don't be afraid to try it out with the story we've set up so far, even if it seems stupid or implausible. Sometimes the best writing comes when you're willing to take a risk. After all, if Kathleen can take one, so can you. As I said at the start of the workshop tonight, there are hundreds of places to go for writing prompts. Here are three that I visit frequently. Writer's Digest is an established organization in the industry. This year, they're celebrating 100 years in existence. They hold a national conference every year, and they also offer a magazine for writers. Every year, they conduct several writing contests, and they also post articles on the craft and publishing, and they update their writing prompts pretty frequently. You can see some of them here. Promptuarium. I use Promptuarium quite a bit. It offers a variety of prompts, everything from lines of dialogue to types of characters to incorporate into your stories and also pictures from time to time. Many of the prompts lean towards science fiction and fantasy, but there are also prompts from other genres and there's a deep bank of inspiration here. So spend a little bit of time scrolling through them. You'll definitely find one that catches your imagination. The Writer Magazine, which I am a huge fan of for everything, especially their articles on the craft and the publishing industry. They always do really interesting features on people and organizations, and every single issue has a directory in the back centered around different themes. Sometimes it's new literary agents or magazines that are accepting new work. The Writer Magazine is one of the oldest in existence. It's been around for more than 125 years, but it's definitely not stuffy or pretentious. Their writing prompts on the website don't get updated as frequently as Writer's Digest, but they're always really interesting, so definitely check them out. I mentioned art and paintings earlier as a possible source of writing inspiration. Here's another resource that I found that offers a good start of virtual tours of art and exhibit museums online. This website called Upgraded Points has collected information from 75 museums all around the world, as close to us as the Art Institute of Chicago and as far, as, as far away as the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. This screenshot is from July, so it's pretty updated. You can find the list and links here. Some of the museums offer actual 360 degree tours of their facilities and others do more traditional slideshows. Either way, it's a great resource for writing inspiration. Also, there are hundreds of great journals out there that publish short stories. I wanna to share two that came to my attention in the last year and that I've been enjoying as a reader. If any of you know of others, feel free to share them in the chat or you can email them later and we can definitely make sure that everybody hears about them. The first line is one of the journals that offers writers the opening line to a story. You have to use the line exactly as it is to write a piece and then submit it for consideration. One thing I really like about this journal is that they don't charge submission fees and they're committed to not doing so. Many journals do charge fees, which helps them keep production costs down, but the first line doesn't. And they also pay if they publish your work. So be sure to take a look at that. One Story started almost 20 years ago and only publishes one story per issue. They come in these little chapbooks. I can show you one right here. Cute little chapbooks. And they're easy enough to read in a single setting. Although the journal itself is small, as you saw, One Story has built quite a reputation of publishing writers who have gone on to win national awards. They also offer workshops and even have a teen version of the journal if you know a teen writer who wants to try their hand at publication. Each story is carefully curated, so they're almost always fascinating. Be sure to check out these two outlets for short stories as well as others. As with writing anything else, the more you read in the genre you want to write, the better you'll get, and the easier it'll be to start new, sh new short stories for yourself. By taking active steps to search for writing prompts and giving yourself a little bit of structure before you begin writing, you'll help yourself produce some amazing stories in your writing career. In conclusion, one of my passions in life is to help other writers, so please don't hesitate to get in touch and follow me on social media. I truly believe that words have the fundamental power 
to change people and the world. And if you're looking for an editor, it would be my honor to work with you on your writing project and make it as polished as it can possibly be. But please do stay in touch and thank you so much for your time and your attention this evening. Thank you, Ekta. That was wonderful. Um, now is the time where we can open it up for any questions. So uh, you can type in the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. So while we have her here, does anyone have any questions for Ekta? I'm happy to answer questions on anything to do with writing novels, short stories, anything you like. Don't feel shy. Okay, I see someone's raising their hand. So Susan, I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes we can. You. Hi, Susan. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of slow on taking notes and stuff. So is there a place you and I tried to do a, you know, photo of the page, whatever, but that didn't work very good. So is there a place where I could um, get the notes? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So um, within the next week, um, by next Tuesday, I will actually um, do a condensed version of all these notes and put them up on my blog. And Solemn has all of your email addresses. So when that goes up, I will let her know and she will email all of you with the direct link. And then you can see the, the meat of what I shared tonight so that you can have it there. And um, you'll also see notes from previous talks that I've done. So it'll be easy for you to refer back to. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, could you put the blog thing back up? Because I didn't get sure. all of that either. Absolutely. Let me. If I can let me share my screen again. There. Okay. Let's see the. Oh, see, I didn't get that right. Okay. So, and like I said, yeah. Solemn has your contact information. So for you and anybody else who wants these notes, um, you'll definitely get them. You'll get the direct link to it. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I'm so glad you were able to come tonight. Do I need to unmute something? Or uh, mute no, I'll back Yeah, I can oh. take care of it. Okay. So it looks like we have a um, question in the chat. Sure. So... Um, first question is, do you have any tips on writing a short story about a real life event? Yes. So what you want to do is take the real life event, um, probably change the names uh, for starters. Secondly, see if you can take the real life event and then maybe exaggerate a little bit. So if, for example, this might sound terrible, but if you're writing about, say, a car accident, and if there were two cars involved, maybe make it a little bit bigger and add another, you know, couple of cars, maybe, you know, some, maybe you add a pedestrian and make it a little bit more dramatic. Um, you know, fiction definitely thrives on conflict and drama. And I don't mean drama in like a bad way. I just mean that, you know, when it's a little bit larger than life, it tends to draw us a little bit more. Um, Make sure you leave out the boring parts. We don't want to hear about how every single morning your character wakes up and drinks a cup of coffee because we all do that. Um, so leave out those bits, the, the regular everyday routine. Definitely focus on the day that um, the character's life changed. And you know, if, if you're drawing from a real life example, it'll definitely be something different that happened for you that day. So even if it's not a change in your overall life, it's definitely a change in your day for sure. So start there and then uh, jump off from there. And if that isn't enough or if that doesn't help, uh, please feel free to email me and we can definitely get into a much deeper discussion about that over email. I'm definitely happy to do that. Thank you. Um, and then um, similar question, but a little different. It says, do you have any suggestions about the process of using the five C's about an actual person and event? So I would say um, go back and start with the character. And if you're using a real life event, think about the person who was at the center of that real life event. 
and then maybe again change a few things about them it's as much to protect the person's identity but also um, just to make that person more engaging um, for the sake of fiction and you know you can do this by changing the person's gender changing their job um, if your original person the real life person is you know five foot ten and a blonde make them five foot two and a brunette and sometimes just by changing those little things the story will actually the character will actually start suggesting different things that need to come out in the story definitely um, don't be afraid to take a real life event and change up some of the specifics you know one thing that um, i think sometimes we don't realize that when we're drawing from our real lives we feel like we have to be really true to the original um, event that happened and you absolutely don't have to if it's fiction if you're writing memoir that's a different story but if you're turning this into a fictional event you can absolutely change anything and in some ways uh, fictionalizing a real life event is your opportunity to um, balance the scales a little bit. So if you have a bully who's picking on a child and the child kind of in, in real life walked away from the situation, you have the opportunity in fiction to give the child, you know, a, a really good zinger to come back with or to beat the bully in some way or, you know, stand up for himself or herself. Um, you know, so don't be afraid to play around with the elements of the real life story. Definitely use the five C's as a baseline, but don't be afraid to give your imagination free reign from the real life event and change things, you know, and, and it's really interesting when you start doing this enough, when you get into that practice of writing, um, soon enough, you'll see that your brain actually starts doing it automatically. You won't even have to sit down and consciously think through these things. Your brain will just start picking the gear. Uh, I've actually been doing that for a novel that I'm working on right now, a novel roadmap for a new book that I want to write. And my brain is constantly, you know, second guessing, okay, well, if your character is this and your conflict has to be this, your complication has to be this. And I've just been doing it for a long time now. So my brain can kind of get into that mode. So again, I hope that helps. If not, feel free to email me and, you know, we can always talk about specific projects too over email. That's one of the advantages is that, you know, you can give me a little bit more information what you're working on that can help you. Thank you, Ekta. Um, another comment just says, thanks for an excellent presentation. I agree. Welcome, my pleasure. We have a few more minutes left. If someone wants to uh, ask a question, they can type in the chat or you can raise your hand. As I said, I, you know, I, I love talking to writers. I love hearing about your stories. Um, it always fascinates me and amazes me what writers, other writers can come up with. You know, there's so many amazing stories out there in the world. So don't feel shy. Don't, you know, don't feel like you're the only one doing this because you're definitely not. And there are plenty of other people out there who are doing what you're trying to do and probably have the same, same question or a similar question. So. Don't feel shy to, you know, to put it in the chat or contact me afterwards and I'm happy to. Absolutely. And while um, we are waiting to see if a question comes through, I do want to give one update. So I'm going to share my screen for a second. So as of today, um, our short story contest is open. Uh, so you can start submitting. Um, you have until November 6 to do so. Um, if you want to find information on uh, entry guidelines and prize information, um, the link is here at the bottom of the page. Just go to champagne.org slash short dash story. Um, and like I said, you can find information about prizes, guidelines, uh, and more. So please submit a story or consider submitting a story. And uh, our next workshop will be on the 23rd at 7 p.m. And the topic will be creative writing uh, led by Maisie Sparks. So we hope you can attend that as well. Okay, it looks like there is another question. So uh, they're asking, I'd like to write a short story slash memoir. Would the five C still apply or is there another framework to follow? So yes, the five C's definitely would apply. 
um, just as an FYI, when we say, when we use the term short story, that typically means fiction. Um, if you're talking about a memoir, a nonfiction piece, that is actually just called creative nonfiction. Um, either way, the five C's definitely still apply because when you are talking about a real life event, you still have one or two people that that event happened to, right? Um, and one reason why we want to share these real life events is because of something dramatic that happened in that person's life. And often that does involve some sort of conflict. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, for example, um, you know, I have a friend who was diagnosed with breast cancer last year and she's pretty young. She's younger than me, um, in her mid thirties. And if she ever decided she wanted to write about that diagnosis and what that meant, um, and how she dealt with all the events of this last year in terms of her chemo and all of that other stuff. She would start with, you know, in terms of the five C's, she would start with the character, which is, you know, herself. The conflict is that, you know, she's been diagnosed with this terrible disease and she's still so young. So in that place, the conflict would be between herself and maybe her own body and herself and medicine. Um, and you can definitely use the five C's, but just think of it in terms of the real life event and, you know, see how they fit there. Um, when you're writing memoir, you do want to be careful to make sure that you focus on the main event. It's really easy when we're talking about our own lives to kind of get a little bit sidetracked. So make sure, especially if it's a short piece, make sure you decide ahead of time what the main message of your piece is going to be. And then stick to that and use the five C's to build up to that. And I think you'll find that even with memoir, creative nonfiction, having the framework actually helps you stay on task and on target with what you're trying to convey. Like I said, if you pick a single theme, like, um, you know, whatever that might be, if you, if you're telling a love story, for example, love conquers all, let's say you have two people who fought all sorts of odds and they wanted to, you know, tell the story of how they finally came together. The theme could be as simple as, you know, love conquers all using the five C's will help, those people stay on task with that theme instead of kind of talking about, you know, the pet that they adopted and when they went on this really cool vacation. And unless those things tie directly to that theme and to the incident that they want to talk about. I think definitely using the five C's in any way, shape, or form specific to your piece will help. And if, if you have questions, let me know, uh, you know, later on by email or whatever. Thank you, Ekta. So I don't see any more questions uh, and we are at the end of our webinar. I do want to say thank you again to Ekta. That was wonderful. Uh, I took a lot of notes. <laughs> um, and I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, like I said, register for uh, the workshop on September 23rd. And with that, we will end it there. Thanks, everyone. It was great to see you. Thanks, all. Good night. Thank you, Epta. Good night, everyone.